So I'm going to speak quite, um, I'm going to tell a story, I guess, about my own, um, my own involvement in um, parallel reporting to the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which I've had the opportunity to do twice. And I'd like to first acknowledge that there are a lot of people in this room and online who have probably a lot more experience doing this, including Claire Mann and Beth Goldblatt, as well as Paul Hunt, who probably um, will notice instantly my amateur errors in this. But I think it will be helpful actually for other people in the room to know how, um, you know, know where I've gone wrong or how, where, where difficulties have arisen um, because thinking strategically about using those processes in the future, that might be helpful, right? So I have had the opportunity to be involved in a parallel report reporting process under the ISESCO um, with respect to the right to housing twice. The first time was in 2015, and it was um, as part of a larger report brought by um, what we would call in the, in the UK a charity, but we could call them an NGO, um, called Just Fair, which is the first um, charity in, the, in England, the first charity in England to specifically target social rights. And I'm going to put a link in the chat for those of you who, let's see if this will work, um, for those of you who are interested. You can see the report that they um, that they produced. Um, so the report was, if you look at the report, you can see it's a 250 page report and it tracked the main social rights in the ISESCO. So I wrote a chapter on the right to housing for them. Someone wrote a chapter on the right to food. There was one on, on um, discriminate, uh, sorry, the rights of people with disabilities. And if there were, uh, and a chapter on the right to health. And so the primary motivation for Just Fair was to use this in domestic advocacy and then take it to the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. So the report that I wrote for them was much longer than something that you could submit to the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. At that point, you could submit something to them that was about 3,000 words um, as your whole report. But they wanted to use this in their domestic advocacy. They wanted to really make a difference in the, um, at home in the political landscape. So um, they approached me and I, uh, I know that one of the reasons they selected me was because um, they were looking for people who would not appear too radical and would be hard to discredit or where, who wouldn't make social rights seem too political. Because this is a problem in the UK that social rights seem this really political, um, non-legal, non-justiciable um, issue. So they selected me to write the chapter on the right to housing for them, but they were also very concerned to, to um, have a lot of buy-in from other major charities who worked in the housing sphere. So there were a lot of negotiations about what could go into the report so that they would get endorsements from the major NGOs around the, uh, the UK. They wanted to come on board to put pressure on the government domestically. So really they were using the, the um, the UN process um, as part of a much longer term strategy, but really hoping to get domestic traction. Um, so in the end, the report was, um, the report I think remains a really significant resource actually. And it, it's, um, I think it's really useful. Um, it got a lot of domestic traction, particularly around the right to food, some around the right to housing as well, but particularly around the right to food. So that brought a lot of attention to Just Fair's work. Um, it then, Just Fair did the work to take that 250 page report and turn it into 3000 words and take that to the committee as a parallel report on the UN's uh, on, the, on the UK's performance under the ISESCO. It took that to the UN and it was really pleased because it um, was able to get some of the language in the report reflected in the UN committee's report on the UK's performance. So um, reflecting some of the concerns in the report and including around the right to housing, which was great, you know, great. I was really happy to see that. Um, and they, so they got that language into the criticism of the UK by the Committee on Economic, Social, Social and Cultural Rights, but they were prevented basically in then bringing that back home as the next plank in their domestic advocacy by the fact that the report was re released in the same week as a significant Brexit development and, and got no airtime whatsoever, <laughs> right? So, um, you know, the best laid plans. But I think the report remains really significant and I think it gave a lot of 
um, it, it, it was a foundation for future work for other charities. So for example, then um, a, a, a number of charities got together and put together a joint report under the Universal Periodic Review, um, specifically targeting social rights as well. So it was sort of a model that was then used again. Um, but it was, so it was with this experience in mind that when I came back to Australia a few years later, in 2019, I thought, well, you know, we should really use these around Australia. And I was aware that Australia's um, reporting cycle was coming up for the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. And a few of us talked around, perhaps actually in this conference a few years ago, about maybe we could do something, maybe we could get together a consortium of NGOs who would take this forward. So in the end, you know, it was the middle of COVID and nobody was thinking about this. Um, but I did end up working with the Mercy Foundation, who's a, um, a charity or an NGO, we would say here in Australia, that takes a structural approach to ending homelessness. And they were open to making a parallel report under the Committee on Economic, Social, Social and Cultural Rights. So now what had happened in the meantime and what I did not realise and what many people I think didn't realise, judging from my frantic calls on Twitter for anyone with any expertise in this area to get back in touch with me with zero responses out there in the Twitter sphere, making me think nobody in Australia, nobody in Australia on Twitter was working in this anyway, um, was that the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights and the reporting process under that had since um, transitioned to what's called the simplified reporting procedure. And just for anyone who doesn't know what that is, so it used to be that the state would produce a report and then you had the opportunity as civil society, NGOs, academics to say, look, you can see this report, but it's not really telling you the whole picture. And I'm going to riff off that report and write my own parallel report here, which is going to show you stuff that the state's not telling you in the report. You no longer have the opportunity to do that. Now the committee produces what's called a list of issues prior to reporting. And the input from um, NGOs, civil society, ac academics has to come before that you have to get your issue onto that list. And to do that, you have to do something that looks quite different. And I'm gonna put another link in here, if I can find it. You now have to just put a, create a list of questions to send to the committee um, that they should ask the government to respond to. So here is that list. So then it's much shorter. There were no examples of lists of issues prior to reporting by NGOs to any state under the uh, ICESCA that I could find because Australia is like the first um, suite of states going through under the simplified reporting procedure. So I found some examples from other conventions that have transitioned to the, to the simplified report, reporting procedure. The thing about the simplified reporting procedure is also changed all the timeline. So you used to have like a year after the state submitted its report to go off and read the report and think about it. Um, and then you could come back with your report. Now you've got three months or six months before the committee examines Australia orally in the first stage to produce your list of questions. We were actually late in doing this, but what I've learned from this was that the committee wants people to engage. They need parallel reports because they are not in a position to evaluate the state's report. They're in Geneva or they come together in Geneva they're only looking at it on the paperwork. Um, they are not really able to, to um, evaluate it. They don't have the person power and they just don't have the, the expertise, right? They need parallel reports. So they really wanted, to, you know, they did everything bent over backwards to allow us to submit our report late. It doesn't appear on the UN website. If you go in and you'll see um, the, the shadow reports for Australia, the shadow lists of issues, you can't find them on the UN website, but they, made it available to the committee and the committee did have us appear before them by Zoom um, and they did you know, examine us and some of the issues that we took up in the list of issues have appeared or the, or on the list of issues prior to reporting that Australia will have to respond to. So it was, um, it felt very hectic, it felt very much like there wasn't much to follow and there wasn't, you know, we neither the Mercy Foundation nor I were particularly um, well versed in how to do this. But I think my takeaways from it would be, from the process overall, is that if you're going to engage in parallel reporting, I think 
um, you need to have both the domestic and the international as angles in mind. So they, you have to be, or, or it works best in my view, if you're using your UN work to gain attention and traction at home um, and that you're using both at the same time to sort of build a picture um, of naming and shaming on one level, but, um, but awareness at home. And that that sometimes will work, sometimes it won't work, and you can't control the circumstances in, um, in which your report or the, the UN's report will come out. Other things are happening in the world, right, that might completely bury them. Um, the other thing I've learned, though, from this is that it will only really make a difference if 10, 15 different parallel reports go before the UN and that all of those organizations or academics or NGOs or whoever they are, individuals even, are using those domestically and then using the international system as well. When we submitted our report, we were one of two organizations, the Mercy Foundation, we were one of two organizations. So it was the Mercy Foundation and a organization whose um, names I have forgotten, but who work on drug policy. And their intervention was really useful and really welcome, but it's, we were both such narrow, um, such narrow focus. So we, knowing that we were one of only two organizations that was going to be um, presenting the Mercy Foundation, and I tried to craft this list of issues as broadly as we could. And we, you could do that with economic, social, and cultural rights, because they're all interrelated. We use them to discuss discrimination, poverty, um, health outcomes. So we tried to use the, the right to housing, which is the focus, to wedge all these other policy problems that Australia has into that report. And we did that by really heavy footnoting and referencing in the report if for anyone who wants, to, or in the list of issues prior to reporting that we provided. Um, I will leave that there. I'm really happy to take questions on it in the discussion, but I think I've come to the end of my time. We've got a couple. I think I'll leave it there, and then because I think you know, it'd be great to, for people to ask questions. But I think it's a it's strategic. You've got to use it strategically. It's really really useful to use it. But I would encourage um, that we really get people using it more broadly because if one NGO does it, it's going to make really no difference. But if you have a great consortium of people, or you've got ten different domestic NGOs, then you might get traction at home and you'll get that reflected in, in the list of issues as well. So Australia now has till 20, September 2023 to, to produce its report, um, following, which should track the list of issues and respond to the, the issues that the committee has asked it. So we've got a while before we'll see what the committee will do, um, but I'm continuing to work with the Mercy Foundation to sort of equip other charities and NGOs and, and individuals to, to use this process in the future. Thank you.